Hey folks, we're gonna have a look at Svalbard now, up in the Arctic. It's an archipelago of islands and you will need to know opportunities and challenges of this cold environment. So if you pop those as your headings, and I'll, as I usually do, just keep it as sweet and simple as possible. So it's an archipelago, which means a collection of islands. It's up and owned by Norway, up in the most northern place you can actually live on planet Earth currently. Um, and the environment is what we call tundra. Okay, tundra is mainly snowy, very cold, permafrost, and then in the summer just the top few inches will thaw out and that allows like little bits of grass uh, to grow and you get almost no trees. It's um, really lichen territory, so mosses and lichen and lots of amazing creatures like arctic fox and polar bear. Um, up here in um, in Svalbard, there is a place, I'm just gonna put a little circle on there, the capital, which is called Long Year Bien. Long Year Bien. And it's a busy place with 2,700 people. So the population, there we go, population equals 2,700, which is a very small, population. Almost everyone will know everyone else. You think about the population of your school, you know, it's not a big number at all. But they live there, they have an amazing time, there's lots of things on offer. The first one, well this one is actually for you perhaps when you're older, the first and biggest opportunity in what a lot of people work in up in Svalbard is tourism. Tourism is huge there. There are shops in Longyearbyen, you can go travelling out to see polar bears and on wildlife excursions. It is an excellent source of income, so it makes Svalbard money and it's also really good for just bringing different nationalities together and people getting to explore and getting to do some wildlife spotting and just have a really, really good time. Now, if you want to travel there to, to engage in tourism, you would need to get on a plane. There is a small airport, or you could come by boat. Okay, so you might even be able to take a boat there. But don't, there's not huge, huge numbers of tourists, but it, they do bring in, they're more adventurous. They do bring in money with them. Um, unfortunately, one of the negatives is when they go out on the 4x4s, which there are some trucks there, some 4x4 trucks, in the summer, they do leave um, tyre tracks. So we'll just put sort of little negatives, is the tyre track damage to the permafrost. Remember the permafrost is that permanently frozen layer of land, permafrost. Okay, now here in the winter, if tyres damage the grass and chew up the mud a bit, um, it's all fixed by the spring. The rain kind of fixes it and it's mild enough to, to settle. There, they just get stuck. So you end up with these um, difficult tracks that leave these big kind of gouges in the snow. Okay, it's, it's quite um, unsightly and also really damaging. Okay, number two is mining. Now, I wasn't sure whether to include this because it is stopping. It's still happening at the moment, but it is stopping. But for many, many years, I've got black here, so I'm going to draw some lumps of coal. Um, yeah, for many, many years, they were actually mining coal. And you can still, if you go there now, you can still see all the old coal mine materials. Uh, obviously, for money you know, great income. It wasn't until that long ago that we were even burning coal in this country. So um, yeah, to make electricity, huge one. But it's not good, it's a fossil fuel and it contributes to climate change. So it's good that they're stopping doing it. Right, one that is very much continuing is fishing. Now, fishing is incredible in Svalbard. There are over 150 different species of fish. So we're gonna have a go. <laughs> drawing a fishing boat. Now their boats are much bigger than this, but just uh, bear with me. 
We're going to draw sort of a little man or woman there with giant fishing net. There we go. Put some fish in there. But they catch, yeah, huge quantities of fish. Um, it is restricted in the sense that you're not allowed to. Um, I just dropped the paper. You're not allowed to catch as much as you want, and you know you can't catch very small fish. There are new laws and measures been put in place in fishing quotas. But essentially, what you need to remember is there is over so in excess 150 different species of fish. Okay, so loads and loads of different species. But the negative, so I'm going to pop a little negative in that one, is overfishing. Now, if you've studied ecosystems, you'll know if you overfish, you're going to massively impact the food web and the food chains that exist in the marine ecosystem. And it's going to potentially have really catastrophic impacts. So the government have had to crack down on this because the waters around Svalbard, as you can imagine, there's boats all over the place. So... Uh, they've got to keep an eye on who's doing what and, uh, yeah, make sure that it's not a problem. Um, and then education is the final opportunity. I wish I'd known about this when I was younger, but basically you can go to university there. There is a university um, in Svalbard, which you can go to, and you can study um, geography, biology, tourism, conservation. I think mainly you know those kind of courses although I bet they're changing them all the time um this is a massive like what we call a pull factor so it's um encouraging lots of people to come and live in Svalbard and study there okay uh which is great so it's you know raising the profile so you can do lots of different courses there now, you might also get asked about some of the more basic challenges uh, or the characteristics of the place, because it is obviously a cold environment. It is, you know, pretty chilly. Um, and we need to kind of get into that a bit as well. So first of all, extreme temperatures. Now, I'm recording this um, in January. Temperatures, there we go. Uh, and it's pretty cold. It's about um, four degrees in the day at the moment, but that's nothing. And it, this cold environment experiences minus 30 or more, you know, minus potentially minus 40 in storms. So people need to be really well dressed. So if you draw a stick person like this, and we're just going to annotate him or her or whoever they are, there we go. So on the head, you have to wear a hat. You can't go outside without a hat because you lose a lot of heat from your head. And you want goggles to keep the snow, uh, let's put that as an L, there we go. Goggles to keep the snow out your eyes or you can get something called snow blindness, which is where the water kind of in your eyes starts to freeze. And that can cause lots of problems. Um, on your hands, you need at least two pairs of gloves and same with your socks so um, two pairs of socks obviously you're wearing your thermals and your clothes as well uh, lots lots of layers I forget exactly how many but it's multiple you know lots of layers and then on top you need your waterproof layers so waterproof and very warm, waterproof and warm, and waterproof and warm. There we go. Um, and then, yeah, finally on your feet, snow boots. Now, if you go in a bar in uh, Svalbard, it's very normal to take your boots off because obviously they're very snowy, they make the carpet wet. Um, so that's very common. You kind of have your indoor shoes and your outdoor shoes, okay? Now, not only do people have to be careful, because otherwise, if you didn't do these things, you could risk hypothermia, you could risk frostbite. Um, but the houses there as well, so if I just 
see if we drew a simple house here it would look you know kind of a bit like that um over there they build them up slightly so they're raised raised up which is because of snow you know and snow blizzards and things like that so you might have you know steps to get to your front door there we go um the other thing is they are brightly colored and that's so well i I guess it's so they can be seen actually in a you know in a snowstorm and things like that but also I think it's just cheerful especially when you remember that Svalbard has some pretty strange weather so it's constant sun constant sunshine like it's very strange this constant sunshine but it's very very sunny for around three months and then the opposite, I'm just thinking where to put this, I might put it up here, draw a moon. Um, and the same is constant darkness for four months. Okay, so it's really extreme temperatures and also the strange, you know, sunshine or lots of darkness, which can really kind of miss, mess with your um, circadian rhythm. Add to the fact there are no trees. Just draw a tree on there and then put a big cross through it. No trees. It's a pretty unusual place. Hopefully you'll agree. Now... What you also find there is, this is a weird one, but people have to get around. There are actually slightly more snowmobiles and polar bears than there are people. Now I'm really unsure how to draw uh, a snowmobile, but I can tell you there are 3,000 of them. You can have a go at drawing one if you like. Um, and what happens with the polar bears is that they, they kind of drift over on pieces of ice from icebergs from Greenland um, and other parts of the Arctic. And these polar bears, they, they're pretty, they mean business. So if you go out of town, you actually have to go with a gun and somebody who knows how to use it. So let's have a little go at drawing a polar bear. This is actually quite tricky. They've got black nose there we go um let's put some legs in place big paws there we go um now polar bears are exceptional creatures they are incredibly good swimmers i think they can swim at something like 20 25 20 miles no they run at 25 miles an hour i think they swim almost as fast they're really good swimmers um and obviously they are perfectly adapted so they have got um, a black nose to absorb the sunshine and the heat uh, their fur is actually transparent and that's weird it's um it's transparent and it's hollow so being hollow it can absorb the heat inside so it traps a layer of air um, and the transparent nature when it's all together it looks white but it's um it's really good for camouflage really good for camouflage um and they've got big paws which are brilliant on the ice as well so super good um, and then there's just one more creature that I want to draw in there which is one I was lucky enough to see when I was in Iceland um, a few years ago and this is the arctic fox um, it's a sly little creature it's very cool it's got um oh, why does it look a mouse that's no good let's <laughs> let's uh i'm better at polar bears i think there we go yeah i've made a little like a mouse but it is i promise you it's a um arctic fox tell you what 
let's write it Arctic Fox. So pretty cool actually as they go. They um, are camouflaged in winter, they're white, so you can barely see them. And then in the summer, they go the same colour as the rocks in, in Svalbard. So they look, again, completely camouflaged as well. So we want to put their fur um, changes colour. Changes colour with the seasons. It's a really good hunting strategy because then they can eat um, eggs and things like that and get away with it. Uh, what else? Hmm. Oh, one more thing. I think we just need to put in extreme temperatures the fact that it gets often to minus 30 degrees Celsius. There we go. So you have it. That's your Core Environment Svalbard case study. And that should be everything more or less that you need to know so that you can do well if you cut. This one comes up often as a nine marker. So best of luck.